Video number four. This is the last one. We're going to finish up everything about this chapter on ecology. And if you remember or saw the other video I did just a little while ago, uh, I was uh, talking about this fun stuff. Mm, that's not very good. Let me show you there. That's better. And in that video, I was talking mostly about how the solar energy from the sun comes down and gets used by the earth, either to regulate our temperature, how it bounces around and hangs on and absorbs some of that heat, how that imbalance of heat and temperature across the globe leads us to the wind currents and ocean currents, which is mostly what we're talking about is the transportation of energy, the, the sort of the distribution of all that stuff. And we didn't really talk about, yes, but does the energy get transformed in any way? Does it, does it get changed into something else? And that's where uh, we deal with this little thing down here, the process that trees uh, undergo, both photosynthesis and cellular respiration, the production of biomass on the earth. Uh, just to remind you, what do I mean by biomass? If you think about bio, meaning uh, living, and mass, meaning just stuff. It's the uh, increase of living stuff on the face of the earth. And the only way you do this, why do we have more and more plant life growing? How is it doing that? It's not doing it by eating other animals. It's doing that by the transformation of light energy into chemical energy. That's exactly what we're talking about when we say photosynthesis. So that's the thing I want to focus on today really get into it and, and exactly how that works. So, here we go. We're going to talk about photosynthesis. Or rather, uh, another way of looking at it is why, why we're not all dead. Because this is at the heart of how everything works on the earth. I know that maybe you're into e eating a nice, nice, delicious burger or something else. And you can say, wait, that's not a plant. That's some sort of a uh, bigger thing. But... I will remind you that no matter what, there's a bit of a, let's say, tree of eating that in the end ends at plants. Because the only reason we have any kind of uh, large scale amount of energy distributing across the earth is because we're getting it from the sun. We don't just stand outside on a beach and collect that sweet, sweet energy. Nope. We need something else to have transformed it into something we can use, specifically into something called sugars. Uh, I'm going to have to talk about that word because sugar means something to you right now, but it means a little, something quite different when we talk about chemistry, specifically in the realm of biology. So I'm going to get into that in a short little minute. What I want to do right now is just talk about photosynthesis in general. So let me just, first off, let me just write that down. Photosynthesis. Photo. Because the name actually uh, helps us understand it a little bit better. Synth. Synthesis, because photosynthesis is actually made up of two separate words, and they refer to two parts of the process. Photo is actually referring to the light reaction. And when I say light reaction, what I mean is that it uses light. It is the part where the actual light from the sun gets used. I'll just put a photo there. Which means, yes, it, uh, there is another process where you don't use light. Um, it is, you know, it actually got originally called the dark reaction. Uh, but this is kind of a problematic name to give it. Uh, because it's not, it doesn't need light, uh, although it doesn't. But that's not really key to it. Uh, I'm going to actually refer to this as the carbon dioxide reaction. Because that's really the key here is that photosynthesis is actually a chemical reaction. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it down here uh, so that we can see it for what it is. All right. So this is the chemical reaction is going to be light. And by light, I just mean energy. The, we're looking at the light coming in as an energy source. So I've added energy to a chemical reaction where I include water, H2O, and carbon dioxide. And this produces the stuff we know and love, mainly 
oxygen. Yay, oxygen. But also, I'm going to write this down as C6H12O6, which is another way of saying a sugar. In this case, this is glucose. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about quite a few sugars uh, just to make that clear. So what, what what's going on here? We're going to have a plant use the water and carbon dioxide around it and combine it with the light energy. And I'm going to talk a bit about how that energy gets used to produce these byproducts, which we then use later on. Well, the plant uses them too. Not the oxygen, though. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, because the fact that oxygen gets created is, is actually kind of interesting. So let's just get into the actual mechanism. And uh, after that, then, I want to talk a little bit about sugars in uh, a little more specifically because they themselves are kind of um, neat. So, so where, where are we getting all this hat? Where is this all happening? Okay, so let's, let's just draw ourselves a little picture. First off, if you look really closely at the green leaves, now specifically, specifically the green stuff, uh, chloro, chlorophyll, which is the chemical that we're interested in, uh, produces a green color. So that's how you actually, that's one of the reasons why plants are green is because the mechanisms, the machines that transform light into uh, light energy into chemical energy uh, happen to produce a green color. So that's why you see all these plants with a green color. In a plant, let's say we're looking inside of a plant, we would see a whole bunch of little, well, first off, we'd see this kind of larger thing called a, let's give this a name, the whole big thing is called a chloroplast. Chloroplast. So that's a chloroplast. Uh, makes up all the little, there's there's millions and millions of those across all the leaves of, of any kind of plant that's green. And if I look inside of them, I'm going to see all these kind of like stacks of, looks like stacks of fat coins. There's a bunch of them. Uh, I'll draw another one over here. And each one of these little green coins, I'm going to give it a name here, is called a thycoloid. Or, sorry, I said thycoloid. Thylakoid. I'm sorry about that. Thylakoid. Now that's what we're interested in. That's what we're interested in. These are all, these are all sort of connected to each other. There's little veiny things connecting them. There's tons and tons and tons of these all over a chloroplast. And so what we're interested in is what's going to happen at the membrane of each, each thylakoid. So not just not in the thylakoid, but actually at the membrane level. So we're interested in the, uh, let me write it down, the thylakoid membrane. And remember that I was talking about how there are two different processes, and one is the light and one is the uh, not light process. And the this is where the photo of photosynthesis happens. This is where we get the first uh, reaction. By the way, inside of every thylakoid is a whole bunch inside is a whole bunch of this chemical that's going to help us out, and that's chlorophyll. I'm actually not going to talk about it in this video. So this is, I guess I should point this out. Every time there's a, there's a little something, I'm going to make a little star by it, but this is something you're going to have to do your own research on. I'm not going to tell you everything. Sorry. Um, so that's already sort of a mystery thing that I'm going to have to gloss over just to be able to get through everything. And in around, now you notice the chloroplast has thylakoids in them, big piles of stacks of them but there's what we're also also interested in is the space uh oops i'm gonna have to dot it out all right there we go the space around the thylakoids this kind of um goo that it sits within is actually really really important this is known as the stroma and the stroma is uh basically where the other the the photo synthesis the actual synthesis happens so a little dot there so just so it's clear this and this is taking place at two 
different points inside of chloroplast. So we're, we're interested first in what's going on in the thylakoid membrane, and then we're going to be a little interested, and I won't talk about it as much, uh, about the stroma and what happens inside there where we have the synthesis happening. So basically we're looking at two things that happen. First we have the addition of water and the production of some new molecules that we're going to talk about. And then they are going to combine with the second part, which is where they combine with the carbon dioxide. And that's finally when we get our sugars and stuff like that. So this is what we're aiming for here. This is what we're aiming for. So first, let's talk about membranes. Now, if I zoom in on a membrane, in other words, uh, let me see. I should draw. I should have drawn this the other way. Hang on. Let me, let me try that. I'm going to bring this down a bit. Here we go. And I'm going to start copying and pasting this thing because this is going to take a while. So what have I drawn here? I've drawn uh, two little guys. Now three and four. I'm going to keep doing this, by the way. This is going to, it's going to be a lot of these. So what are these? What am I drawing? Well, I'm basically drawing what you would see if you looked very closely at the skin of a chlor of a, um, sorry, of a thylakoid this cell, this plant cell, and all cells will have, here I'm just going to move it over a little bit, let me try this again, please work, yay, okay, that's pretty good, Woo, that's great, so this is a cell membrane, and, and you'll notice that they have a curious kind of look, and, and when you look at a, um, uh, a biology textbook, they're always going to draw them like this, what am I looking at? So let's just get that out of the way. What's the importance of a cell membrane? Well, it's supposed to protect the insides from the outside. That's one thing. But more importantly, it's, it's supposed to regulate how often things go in and things go out. It's accounting for that movement of all the nutrients that a cell needs, but also uh, waste deposits that it wants to throw out. So a cell membrane is based, I've drawn it this way, but what you're looking at are individual molecules that are facing each other in a certain way. And what this does is it creates a, a, a very good boundary between the outside and inside that can't allow things to go in. In fact, this thing uh, doesn't even allow water to go through. You can't, water doesn't naturally just flow in and out of a cell. It needs to come through certain openings. And that's the key. That's the key of what we're interested in is, okay, so if this is stopping everything from going through, how does that work? So first off, just to make it clear, these are molecules. Um, the circles represent a certain uh, set of uh, atoms bonded together that kind of look like a, kind of a large head to the whole thing. And then uh, you might notice I've drawn these two lines. And what's going on there is a chain of carbon atoms linked together in a long line, um, sort of like something I'm just going to draw down here for a second. It's sort of like it goes there, then it goes there, then it goes there, then it goes there. And it just keeps going down and down and down and down. And down. And you have this kind of long tail. And so the way they work is they kind of like face each other like this, giving this kind of impenetrable wall on either side that you don't normally have the ability to go through. Once again, this is how this whole thing's going to go down, baby. All right. So I've got my membrane. I'm going to bring this down a little bit. And like I said, there must be areas that allow stuff through. And what we're going to have there is going to be uh, proteins. And proteins are simply uh, just slightly more complex molecules that have very interesting shapes. The neat thing about proteins is that their geometrical shapes sometimes turn them into little machines. And the machines, what I mean is literally the geometry of the molecule can make it move can make it move and therefore allow openings, even doors that open and close, even um, things that basically go through almost like like a clockwork machine that can do stuff for you in in a living cell. So they're, they're really interesting things. We're not really going to be talking about them too much. I'm only going to draw them not as a molecule, but as a big blob. So they're not just blobs, okay? I'm just saying, not just blobs. But what we're going to talk about here is how they get used. So that also is something that you're going to have to do a little more research on yourself. They are incredibly important and really affect 
uh, how things work. Because as you can notice, what have they done? There are these breaks in the cell membrane allowing stuff to move in, move out, or just do something. So what's this first protein? I'm not going to talk about what they're called. There's a series of them here. In fact, I'm actually, you know what? I'm going to draw everything here. There's another one that's going to be over here. It's actually hanging out slightly in the middle. It does something like this. And once again, I'm not interested in just making names. I'm not going to do that right now. So, sorry. But they're, they are part of the stages of the photo, of the photosynthesis steps. Um, there's also kind of a, a protein that sits on the face of your cell. And then lastly, this is the cool one. There's a really cool one over here. And I'm going to draw, I'm going to try to draw it a little bit right because it's a, it's, it's a fascinating kind of tubey thing. It actually looks like, um, sort of like, what does that look like? Kind of like a, um, a red pepper you get in a store. And then there's a tube with another thing on top that actually looks similar to that as well. And in fact, there's, you know, if I was going to draw this right, I would say there's also another thing, right? Like this kind of a, gloop, a gloopy thing. That's, that's the basic idea. These are all a bunch of proteins that are situated on the cell membrane and allowing uh, movement in and out if it wants to. So we're going to talk about how that works. So let's start off over here. Step one, we're just going to call it number one over here. And uh, should I do another color? I should do another color. Let's draw that. Um, let's try. It's just a nice bright orange. Cool. All right. So what's going to happen? Zing. All right. So what do we got? Light. First thing happens. Light hits this first protein. <laughs> And what's happening to do is that it's, it's basically energizing this protein to, to slip into action, to slip into action. And what's it going to do? Well, it's basically going to rip apart um, a water molecule that's located inside the cell. So the water molecule, first we get light, and then I'm going to write down over here, this is number two, is that the water molecule is now going to break up. So how's it break up? Well, it actually does several things. There's there's basically three things that are going to happen simultaneously. And I'm going to draw them like this. So just so that we get a sense of how they're there. So first off, uh, actually, it's two, two water molecules. I'm going to put a little two there because, well, you'll see what I mean there. I'm going to get four hydrogen ions, hydrogen ions. So this is, uh, if you recall, a hydrogen normally is uh, got one proton, one electron. But in this case, this hydrogen has actually lost its electrons in the process of being broken apart. It's not, it doesn't have the, the, the happy electrons. Um, so really all it is, is a nuclei, a positively charged nuclei. Cause if I lose the one electron on the hydrogen, then well, there's no more electrons. And then I also got, uh, a nice happy oxygen, uh, molecule, uh, double bond, uh, 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 oxygen bonded to itself. So, yay, it's all happy. Um, and as a result, um, if you look at the, all the separate charges, I actually have an excess of electrons. And so I get an electron on its own leaving. And that actually is the one, one I'm mostly interested in. But we're talking about these three things happening. So what's the deal? Well, first off, I have the hydrogen ions, the positively charged hydrogen ions, starting to hang out down here, still inside inside the cell the oxygen believe it or not and this is what's kind of weird the oxygen is waste the plant has no use for it doesn't care about it and the oxygen will find I'm, i shouldn't draw this this way but it will eventually because it's not actually moving Ooh, what happened? okay let's try this here um oxygen is waste waste and so it is going to go away it's going to go away away to help those in need yeah okay so away all right so i'm, I'm wasting way too much time on that Okay, so 
oxygen is just a waste product. The positive charged hydrogen ions are just hanging out. And so the only thing that I'm kind of like keen on here is the electron. The electron now is actually going through a whole bunch of steps. So I'm just going to, let me just try to make this a nice big thick thing here. This is, that's better. So away it goes. It goes through this. It goes through that. It goes through other stuff. It, it, it goes through, the, whoops. It goes through this. We kind of goes through that. And then it's up there. So it goes on this journey. And this actually, uh, it, it does have a name. Um, we're going to call this entire thing, uh, where I should point to all this, but we're going to call it the electron. Oops, I should probably drop the size of my uh, pen here. That's a little too, a little too thick. Let's try this down. Drop down in size. The electron, that's better. This is the electron transport chain. Okay, it's a whole set of proteins that the electron is pushing through. Now, the electron wouldn't have done this unless it was given some energy, and that's what the light is for. So the light is powering, it's powering the dot, 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 electron transport chain. So why is it doing this? Well, while it goes through this, um, what we find is that we're also producing more reactions with things that end up creating more um, at this point, we have eight, eight. At this point, we have 12. We've got a whole bunch of byproducts. And one of the big byproducts is the fact that we're getting a whole bunch of hydrogen ions inside the cell. But another thing is being made, and this is what gets kind of interesting, is that two molecules are created. So um, the first one, first molecule is something that is called NADPH. So I'm just going to draw it as this little, let's just, this is just a silly little drawing of like, you know, molecule. Let's just, you know, I'm not drawing it properly at all. In fact, here, you know what? I'm going to show you a picture of NADPH just so you get a sense of why I'm not drawing it. Uh, this should be it. Yes. So this is NADPH. Now, uh, w once again, it is called NADPH. It stands for uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. So I'm not going to say that very much. I might not even have said it properly, but basically it is a fairly special molecule um, mainly because of its uh, combination of elements and uh, geometric shape stores a lot of energy stores a ton of energy so basically what this is a part of is the well, where's my picture now is this my picture this is my picture so what we're saying here is that now what we've created here is ndap nadph that is stored energy. We've turned the light energy that was provided to um, everything here from light. The energy provided by light was involved in the creation of a molecule that wouldn't have had that extra energy. There's the reactions required energy. The light provided that energy. And now that energy is stored up inside that molecule. But we have another thing that's going to happen and and it's going to happen right through here let me just uh get that purple color again i like that purple color so now we have all these hydrogens positively charged so if i had to look at this um i could say well wait a minute here's the whole giant uh thylakoid remember this is just uh the the thylakoid uh, membrane. So this whole line is the membrane. It's all along here. This is happening everywhere along this surface. And then I'm slowly building up a whole bunch of hydrogen ions on the inside. And what does that mean? Well, it means that I've got an imbalance. So these hydrogens are going to want to get the hell out. They're going to want to get out. But of course, the membrane won't let them. Ah, but it will. 
it will let them only at this one point. There's going to be one point that's going to let them through, and that's right here. So what we're going to have is a protein that allows the hydrogens, the hydrogens to move through this protein to get out. Now, why only through here? Because they're not just moving through. What's happening is that we have what's known as ATP synthase. In other words, the synthesis of a new mother, a second molecule called ATP. Uh, do I have a picture of it? Yes, I do. Here's here it is. Ah, and this is uh, stand, ATP stands for uh, adenosine triphosphate. So ATP is another molecule, once again, just like NADPH, which has a pile of stored energy and can be used later. And uh, it leaves the cell at specific points. So what we got is a uh, two molecules hanging out outside of the cell. This is the whole point of the photo of photosynthesis, is to create two molecules that have enormous stored energy and now can be used at another point. So what's going to happen there? I'm just going to kind of go back to a more general look here. There's the chloroplast. Here's all the thylakoids. And so what happens is that combining the water and the light energy, I get the creation of ATP and NADPH molecules. Now that's cool. So we've, we've taken care of the issue of like what's going to be involved with, let's say, you know, let me just try to do this here. I've taken care of how light energy is being used. That's, that's the sort of one way of thinking about it is that it kind of charges the system into action. It needs energy to get going. This is the energy. Boom, baby, you're going. And then the water, water, remember, breaks up into hydrogen ions and oxygen as a waste product. Remember, it's just going like, who needs this? And throws it away. Um, I also, of course, get the electron that is charged by the light energy and gets this stuff going. But you'll notice something I haven't included yet, that CO2 over there. And that's what happens outside of the thylakoid. So outside of the thylakoid, in what in, you might remember, out here in this stuff is known as the stroma. And in the stroma, this is where we have uh, the other phase taking place. And that's where the carbon dioxide so that's where the CO2 plus my ATP, my NADPH, um, and I'm not gonna, um, not gonna really get into the whole process. This is, of course, another thing you must research on your own. Figure it out, guys. And then this is gonna end up creating the sugars, the sugars, these beautiful stored molecule, the stored, not stored molecules, sorry, energy stored molecules this these molecules that hold on to the energy in really interesting ways and that's what i want to talk about last year is a little bit about the sugars so just before i get to that though a mention about this okay a mention about what i've been saying because maybe it doesn't hit you entirely here but what happened at the very beginning of the life of the earth very beginning of the life of the earth what was going on well there was an earth yeah. and then at some point there were trees i think i've said this before to you but there was a point where there was no no animals no insects no complex life forms apart from plant life and so the sun energy is coming down Whee! and the plants were like, yummy, and they were doing photosynthesis. So they were making themselves grow new trees and, and more of themselves and copying themselves. Why? Because the photosynthesis was basically transforming uh, into the sugars. That's the C6H12O6. And uh, is it O6? Yes, it's O6. And so the sugars are going back in and making new stuff and then I'm getting more trees. Yay, more trees and everything. And where's it getting all the carbon dioxide? Why, well, it's in the, in the air. Awesome. Because at that time, 
Um, our air was not exactly good for other living creatures. Why? No oxygen. There was no oxygen in the air. In other words, we would not have existed if there weren't trees before we existed. Because it's the trees and the plants on the earth that were churning through this process. Just madly going through it all the time. Releasing oxygen every time they did it. Because who cares about the oxygen? I don't need it. And releasing that into there. It was doing two things. First off, it was using carbon dioxide, which means it was taking... Oops, sorry. Taking carbon out. Whoops. Carbon out. And then it was whew, putting oxygen in. Yay! Why? Because this was starting to create an atmosphere that we could live in. If we didn't have this entire thing going on, we wouldn't have been around. It's a fascinating thing to think about, that this process of all these trees just churning away, saying, hey, we got a way of making more of us, and they start doing it, and it starts going on for a long time, actually changed the entire earth to make it livable for other creatures. Anyway, kind of a neat thing. Kind of a neat thing. So if we go back to what we were talking about before, what do we got? We got the production of glucose. We got the production of sugars. And what do I mean when I say sugars? Let's get into that a little bit. So I'm going to talk briefly about that just so that we can understand why, how this works. Because otherwise we're kind of stopping and saying, yeah, then make sugars and everybody's fine. Yeah, Okay, what, what do you mean by this? Do you mean I just got to be swallowing up a pile of table sugar all the time? And I can survive because all I need is sugar in my body. No, that's not what I mean. Because we have a misunderstanding of what the word sugars mean. I mean, sugars does include that. But what we mean by sugars really is what you may have heard called carbohydrates. And when I say carbohydrates, that's another word for sugars. In other words, sugars and carbohydrates is basically referring to the same thing. Carbohydrates is generally how you hear about it uh, when we're talking about chemistry because it has a much better way of ex understanding what it is by the name. Sugars doesn't really refer to anything, but a carbohydrate refers to the fact that I have carbon and these things called hydrates. Now, what's a hydrate? That's actually a very specific combination of carbon oxygen and hydrogen. In other words, a carbon molecule, car molecule, sorry, a carbon element or atom is combined with an oxygen and a hydrogen. I know normally I should be showing this as an oxygen that is also bonded to a, a hydrogen, but we don't usually draw them like that. You're going to see, you're going to get used to this, that we just know it is. So we just simply say OH to make things easier on ourselves. And then the other side of the carbon, we have a hydrogen. Notice hydrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, hmm, water. And so hydrates combined makes carbohydrates. That's what we're interested in. So um, I'm going to show you a picture of glucose. So we want hydrate uh, added to another hydrate. And in this case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the position of the hydrogen and the, uh, and the OH. And then I got this one and then I got another one and it's this chain of hydrates that we call a sugar I'm not done but this is basically the idea is that you have a series of these and I can tell you what kind of sugar it is uh, also by the order in which I have OHs and H's on one side and the other also the number of carbons tells me something and what's at the end of these so usually at the end of a sugar i have and i'm going to write it down in two different ways i could call it a c h 2 oh that's generally how you're going to see it what that really means is that i have it down to a carbon that's connected to a hydrogen a hydrogen and an oh but we generally what you're going to generally see is people just writing it like this and then at the top i have two possibilities in this case i'm going to have a carbon singly attached to, singly bonded, sorry, I shouldn't say attached, bonded to a hydrogen and double bonded to an oxygen. 
This actually has a name. This is known as an aldehyde. I could possibly have something where it's just somewhere along the line. I have a carbon just double bonded to an oxygen and nothing else. Uh, we call this a ketone. And so I can have a different sugar if I took this off and replaced it with a ketone. It would be a totally different sugar, even if I had all the other things the same. Even having my hydrogen, if I had, say, changed this to a OH and then over here was an H, that's an entirely different molecule. And that's the important thing is that the geometry of things, it has the same number of stuff. But where everything's connected actually matters quite a bit. And I have different molecules as a result. So this is, um, I have uh, what I call a functional group at the top. I have my tail at the bottom and I got my series of hydrates. And this is what a sugar is. And this is what's known as, uh, this is actually glucose. And this is what's known as a simple sugar. Um, but there's another word for it that we're going to use, and I'm going to call it this, mono, mono being one, and saccharide. Uh, because this becomes kind of important, because remember, what we're talking about is that the sugars are created in a way that they hold a lot of energy. Because this is drawn in a way to get you just an idea about the order of things, it makes it easier to figure out what it is by looking at the order of the OHs and the Hs and what's at the ends and stuff like that. But this is a very, very simplified picture of what the molecule actually looks like. It's not spread out in a line like this. This is simply being drawn this way so you can understand how to read it. But if I was going to talk about what it looks like, I could draw it a different way. And I'm going to draw it now where the carbons, I'm not even going to draw the carbons. Right there is a carbon right there. But I'm just going to just you'll just have to know that there's a carbon there and i'm going to make the carbons attached to uh, each other and then form a ring so i got that i got down whoops let's just see if i can get rid of that oh yeah i can and then i got that i got that and then i got my ox i got that oxygen that's that guy over here so this is also glucose this is also the sugar but now it's in the shape of a hexagonal ring and this is really how we would prefer to show it because what it makes it obvious is that i can go from a monosaccharide to a polysaccharide and this is where things get a little more interesting because yeah okay this monosaccharide has some energy in it but what if i took off actually before i do that i'm going to just copy paste this thing this is going to make it so much easier for myself I'm going to just do this. Wee. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here. Let me just get this ready. And I'm going to say, how about right here, right where I'm looking at, I take away the H's. Actually, an OH goes away. And then it just simply bonds with the oxygen. Now I've got two combined with each other. Wait, couldn't I do that again? Of course I can. This one can go and bond to another monosaccharide. And then, here, I'm just going to draw it like this. You get the idea. I'm not going to, well, okay, I'll draw all the OHs. So what's happening? Oops, that's an O right there. Now I've got what's known as a polysaccharide. In other words, a string of monosaccharides all bonded together in one big long line. And this is how you have plants and animals storing a pile of, a pile of energy together is by having these polysaccharides where now I've I've got this sort of carbon rings that's attached to a whole bunch of other carbon rings in a row. It's taken the, this is where all the energy from the sun went to create these things, which means if I release or break the bonds in these things, I'm going to actually have a lot of energy released and used for other things, such as say, my, I don't know, my muscles or something like that. Now, I did mention that this, this thing here is it's an idea of what it looks like, but still, still, it's not really the true shape. It's still making it look like there's this flat pancake of a hexa hexagon, and then I have all these things spread out, but it's all like flat on a piece of paper. It's not. So if I look from above, I might see something like this instead. In other words, there's say, let me see if I can draw this right. I'm drawing this and this right here and then I could say the next two pieces 
could come down like this and then the last part of my hexagon would look like this. So it's sort of like this bent object. And then I got to think, okay, but what about the OHs? Well, the OHs I would start drawing as maybe they're going up or maybe it's going down. And the and whether or not they go up or down actually matter. I could be drawing this entirely wrong for all I know. I'm sorry, I didn't actually check to see what was the proper way of drawing glucose. So I, uh, for, uh, please forgive me if I drew this wrong. But the idea is that, yeah, this thing's actually like a bent shape. It's not this flat hexagon. And whether or not this OH is going up or down matters. It actually matters. It changes the entire geometry of the molecule and makes a different molecule, which has everything to do with why over here I would draw the HOH or the OHH, depending upon which row. That is also describing whether I have a OH pointing up or an OH pointing down. Yeah, right, because I have to remember there's also an H. There you are. And so all this goes to show how complicated things can get because I haven't really gotten into a lot of the uh, entire process. I didn't talk about a a ATP or NADPH and how it gets involved to make this uh, synthase of sugars. This synthesis of sugar, I haven't really gotten into the chemistry of it, but there's a whole pile of stuff that we can get into later if anybody's interested. Happy to talk about that. But it gets you at least a basic idea about how the entire process works sort of the foundation of all living things out there is that taking of the sun energy okay taking that sun energy powering with that light energy a process where an electron is taken from the breakdown of water where that then leads to the creation of some complicated molecules NADPH and the hydrogen ions on the inside of the of the entire, uh, what am I trying to say, the entire uh, cell, then leads to it getting pushed out through very specific proteins and forms another complex molecule known as ATP. That in the process of that, I also create a waste product, so-called waste product, oxygen, that then gets used by other creatures to keep themselves alive, such as us. We need that oxygen. Thank you, thank you, plants. And the one thing I didn't really talk about, I don't know if I can find that original equation. There we go. There we go. I haven't even talked about this. I know some of you might even be asking, but you might say, what about this other thing you said? Cellular respiration. Because all we've talked about is this reaction. Well, if I add some chemical energy to oxygen and a sugar I will have a reverse reaction that will create water and carbon dioxide notice that when you breathe that oxygen in you breathe out carbon dioxide why is that happening because the cells in your body are undergoing a whole series of chemical reactions that is the opposite of photosynthesis that is the production of some byproducts and water and uh, the transformation of energy. And it's basically by taking those bonds of your, uh, of your sugars and releasing them as energy to get used into some other process throughout your body. It's how we live. So what we actually have, which is kind of interesting now, is that we're so much a part of this cycle because, yes, the plants gave us the oxygen, but now we're actually part of the process that gives them back their carbon dioxide, which they love so much to start the whole thing off again. So, interestingly enough, we've become kind of a, a part of the whole deal by somehow hooking on to being able to use the, what the plants were just throwing away because they had no use for it. Anyway... That should give you a basic general overview. That's ecology, uh, the basics of ecology and the things that start off everything else. We haven't got in and even to anything beyond that, which would involve things like evolution. It involved things about the complex systems of how uh, animals, plants, and other living organisms actually interact with each other, how they compete with each other for food, and how that actually creates what some people would call a balance, but you might call just simply a system that for the time being works out. We can talk all about that some other time. If you got any questions, please just simply ask, and uh, I'll be happy to get into more detail as this was really just kind of a general overlook of the whole chapter. All right. There you go.